have a GE? Yeah. That was where his puppy was with. Do you need a GE? Georgie? 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 I'm also an evaluator for this right now. And then, uh, table topics master, I have the questions already set up, but I have to leave a little early today. Or else we'll make it on time. Does anyone of you all maybe read the table topic for today? Okay, I know is it? Or, ah, You're the evaluator, right? Though, yeah. Charlotte, do you want to be table topics master on celebrities? <laughs> oh, wait, you're evaluator too? I can do it. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can. Charlie? Okay, Tony or Arsh. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got questions left over from last week, so if you don't <laughs> have any, I can, we can switch. Yeah. I, you can be GE and I can be table topics if you want. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, mean she's yeah. Had the question. You have the questions. I have the questions, but I mean it's flexible too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going off the meeting theme, but do yeah. you want to input? Never mind. If you got yeah. questions, then it's fine. I'll post it to the group then. You guys can use it every time. Oh, <laughs> and then, right without then. further ado, we're going to uh, introduce our first toast. It's her first oh. Toastmaster role this morning, Arsh, and then she's going to also do the invocation on what the meeting theme is for today. <laughs> Yeah, okay. first time. I don't think I did things right. So, um, yeah, I had some it's trouble a learning experience. populating <laughs> the agenda. But yeah, next time I'll, I'll definitely have it. Um, all right, so for today's meeting, I kind of wanted a theme of um, celebrity influence because uh, I was just thinking of yesterday about what we should um, have our theme about. And um, last week, as many of you know, Kobe Bryant passed away. Mm -hmm. So that affected many people, and he was a celebrity. And knowing that that influence he had, not just on people that were interested in basketball, but to like everyone around, was so profound that uh, it just got me thinking how celebrities really influence our values, our worldviews, and many other things. So that's why I chose the theme of celebrity influence. And it's not just uh, athletes that influence us, it's politicians, um, entertainers like Leonardo DiCaprio. He's <coughs> using his platform for environmental, as being an environmentalist um, and bringing more awareness to endangered animals. So that's really cool. As well as even um, Kim Kardashian. I know we all hear about her so much and we know about her TV show, but she's um, kind of played a big role in um, bringing awareness to wrongful imprisonment and helping people get out early that were imprisoned wrong, or yeah, imprisoned wrong, and um, just things like that get you thinking of how celebrities really impact our worldview. And with that being said, I wanted to welcome um, the first speaker, I believe. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm GE, but I oh. really don't know who's speaking and who should evaluate who. Uh, can you yeah. go over that real quick? Why yeah. means first speaker. So why means? I will be about first evaluator. Okay. okay. First speaker would be, next Next speaker would be, oh, Scott. 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 He's, yeah, he's yeah. not here yet. Scott. Um, Scott. And then Scott. Uh, yeah. Starlet will be. Scott's so evaluator. you'll either yeah. be second or third speaker, depending on how Scott shows, right? Well, do we have third speaker? No. Oh, I, I mean, not that I know of. Okay. No. Well, Scott doesn't show, right? No, no. He's the second speaker. Right, if he doesn't show. Yeah. So, so anybody want to be a speaker? One or two speakers. <laughs> two or three, you mean? No, one or two. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so I thought there was three. three. Yeah, two. It's only two. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But I think Scott's coming in. He's just coming in a little late. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, who is the second evaluator? My second evaluator? Ah, uh, Starlet. Who is second? Starlet's the second. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. No problem. Um. All right. So, why me? Where are you? Oh, right over here. <laughs> You're usually over there, so that's why I just naturally <laughs> work that way. You're messing everything up. <laughs> <laughs> So why me? Um, his title of his speech is going to be Robot Business Success Story. Right? Okay. So I'm, I'm going to do it now? Yeah. Uh, right. That's or why. No, Duty Masters. Oh. Uh, we go do to Duty Masters. Okay. Okay. Rules? Oh, we went to rules. I, th I thought that. Yeah. I just did that just because I didn't know. No, I'm talking about uh, explaining. 
Well, oh, yeah. we're running yeah. out of time. So yeah. yeah, we can skip. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Why am I good? Sell it as, as you can see here. <laughs> to a dusty room is the traditional broom and dustpan. Very easy, very low cost. You come in, you just sweep things up and collect it. It'll take some time because for this room, it'll take maybe 10 minutes to clean up. So a better solution to that, of course, is the vacuum cleaner. And the vacuum cleaner would do it much better it was still most likely take another 10 minutes to clean up just because it takes that much time. The problem with the back vacuum cleaner is very loud. It also has this power cord that runs around and then you have to plug it in and then if it's not long enough, you have to move it around. By the time you finish, it actually might take more than 10 minutes to clean up the room. So people have been trying to say, what if we build a robot that runs around and clean the room? So, in 2002, this robot came out, the Roomba, and it mostly cleaned the room. It satisfied a number of conditions, and the idea is most, what's the most minimum viable product, MVP, for this product. Mm -hmm. So here are the, 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 the key things that the inventor of the Roomba robot did. They want it, of course, to run by itself. So you don't need to drive it around. You don't need like a broom or a vacuum cleaner. You have to go around and actually physically do it. You just turn it on, it'll run around and clean the room by itself. It'll clean the floor, primarily the floor, not the tables, not the ceiling, only the floor. And wherever it can get to. If the tables in the in the area, it won't get to it. It'll last long enough, that's the other one, is because there's no power cord running around. It has to last long enough. It'll last around an hour or 45 minutes. So it can clean the room reasonably well. The main thing is it was reasonable, uh, affordable. Because around 2001, a year before, there was another company, Electrolux, introduced the robot vacuum cleaner. Cost $1,600. Most people would not buy a $1,600 robot to clean the room. It takes them maybe half an hour to clean the room. In fact, the Roomba would take 30 to 45 to 60 minutes to clean the room. Because the way it clean is it just bumps around the walls, and then wherever it gets to, it goes to the next place. And if you leave it long enough, it will clean the room because it will hit every place in the on the floor randomly, randomly, and that, that was a trick. And the reason why the inventor of this robot did it that way is because they want to lower the cost so much that there are not too many sensors on that thing and not much computer in that robot. So it can just be cost effective. The initial price when it came out was 190 a lot lower than $1,600. And, and so 
That is what they did for the minimum viable product. In terms of the company that invented this robot, iRobot, I'll go through the history because I think the history tells us how a robot business would need to be successful, at least from the iRobot perspective. The company was started in 1990 by three founders, Rodney Brooks, Colin Engel, and Helen Grenier. Uh, Rodney was a professor at MIT, the other two were his students, and they founded this company. They didn't actually know what to do, they just wanted to build robots. So they wanted to build a business. The first robot they came up with was something that was supposed to walk on the moon, and since they couldn't send it to the moon, their way of making money was supposed to license the robot to movie companies so that the movie company would pay them for the idea of a robot on the moon. It didn't work out. And in fact, it took them many, 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 many different tries to be even successful until they get the rumor. In the meantime, they had to sort of find ways to make money. And their way to make money was military defense contracts, building robots that can find landmines and things like that. And that way, they were able to sustain themselves in Massachusetts. And over a period of 12 years, from 2000, uh, 1990 to 2002, they had to do these military contracts. They, uh, but what they have done, they didn't make much money, but what they were able to do is uh, find a lot of expertise, people. Because to build a robot is not that easy. You have to be able to know the mechanical, the electronics, the software, everything else that goes on in that box to make it work, and you need certain expertise. And so they were able to find people over time to do that. And they, of course, collected, built a number of technology and also patented a lot of those things. And when they finally came up with the Roomba in 2002, it was a consumer product, very different from a defense product. But they have a lot of experience building robots and lowering the cost and making it work. So they were, they had 90, over 90% 90 of the market at that time. And they were able to maintain that for almost six, five to six years uh, until the next competition from Samsung and other folks come out. So they had a essentially a six year advantage. This, this idea of six year advantage is very interesting because that's what Jeff Bezos talked about with Amazon a lot in, gain, in getting with AWS and a number of other products that Amazon came out with. That you're having that much runway before the other guy, your competition come in. In that case, iRobot was successful. It became a public company uh, in 2005, 2013. It sold about 10 million units over the years. And by 2018, it still had over 15 or 52% of the market for these robots that essentially just cleaned the floor. Uh, so. The success factors for iRobot was, it was first, it was low cost, it satisfied the minimum viable product uh, for $199, and, and eventually it cost, uh, cost more. It has enough features that it was profitable. And the other thing they did, is they did a lot of brand marketing. iRobot became a brand. In fact, they were working with celebrities. Uh, in 2016, Jessica Alba was doing this I, uh, Roomba Pong on TV with some other guys uh, just trying to <laughs> do Pong using iRobots. And in fact, Jennifer Lawrence in, 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 when her, in the wedding had iRobot on her uh, registry. So something important to do, and they have a six-year lead. Nowadays, there are a lot more competitors in this space, and in fact, people are adding a lot more features into it. We won't go over that, but the idea is you can add more features after you start it with a minimum viable product. So to summarize, iRobot, iRobot was successful because they had the right minimum viable set of features in the product, and they have six years of dominance. And because they minimized the product to make it
it profitable, they were able to sustain themselves as opposed to some other robot company that did not survive. Mr. Toastmaster. Oh, Mr. Toastmaster. Mm -hmm. to learn about the iRobot and then seeing how celebrities put that on the registry list too and then influence all of us who want those kinds of things. Um, up next we have Scott. I have He'll, a oh, minute for feedback. Oh sorry, minute for feedback. Someone says it, uh, everyone says it. <laughs> 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 All right, so maybe I'll call up the next speaker, Scott. Scott will be presenting on the coronavirus, so um, something that we've all heard of. And just as a celebrity, his favorite celebrity is Elon Musk because he helps reimagine um, current technology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. glad that we have a lot of people today. Um, so today's topic I want to talk about is coronavirus. This has been a hot topic recently and because I come from China I also experiment kind of first hand how the panic game spread. So I want to give a story about how I come to know about this and what I think will be some practical cautions that we can take. The first time I hear about the coronavirus is about the very beginning of this year. Of course, the breakout happened in December in China, in central China, um, in a province called Hubei. And when it come out, they also have this confusion about, oh, is it really contagious between people? Is it just from animal to people? Because what people find out is the source of this disease, the coronavirus, is from some kind of animal, and they have a mutation of this virus, and then it becomes contagious, and it can, can transfer to per people. So that's how this virus started, and becomes a breakout. At the very beginning of this year, when I first heard of coronavirus, I my first, think, uh, first thought is, Oh, how should I tell my parents to take more caution? Because in many cases, the parents, uh, uh, my parents, people in maybe the 60s, 
60s, 50s, or 40s even, are less likely to really follow all these precaution rules than younger people, to some extent. And I call them, I ask them, okay, do you guys have masks? And they say yes. Um, so I just go through with them on how severe everything is. And then we have to discuss this because the Chinese New Year is coming up and everybody has travel plans. And that's how virus spread. This is a huge concern around this area because um, this year, the Chinese New Year is around mid, mid <coughs> January. So they do decide to drive to um, my hometown. They live in southern China, and uh, our hometown is mid-China, like middle China. So instead of taking a train, they decided to drive there, uh, which is very tiring. So they have to take care of that. And then after they go home, they have to, um, they're going to have a lot of meeting, not meeting, meeting with a lot of people, like relatives, friends. So that has also be, um, you, have, you also have to be cautious doing that. How do you get transmitted? So that is the other piece of information that I find very in important, is how coronavirus spread between people. So it turns out you can't get coronavirus from another person. But there are several ways you can keep it at bay. The key information here is you get the virus transmission from close contact by touching, um, kissing, or other, you know, uh, touch of hand, and also by droplets. That means your cough, your sneeze, and other um, liquid or solid things that come out of your body. So this way, we know that it's not like measles where the virus just spread airborne. That means if you are just sharing the room, you can get it. But coronavirus, the new coronavirus that break out this year is similar to other coronavirus like flu. You can only get it from close contact or droplets. That means if you keep a fair distance between people, that means at least a meter or three feet in the other um, unit, you'll be fairly safe. The other thing is we have to wash our hands very frequently. If you touch anything that may, you know, other people may have touched, or if you, um, you know, shake hands with anyone, or you go to a public space before you touch your mouth, your nose, or your eye, which have these membranes that the virus can go through, you should also wash your hands. This is the first thing you should do: wash hands and also keep a safe distance to people that may have any syndrome. So having this in, um, in mind, also they shorten their plans of all of visits, they go back home and stay at home. So that is the third piece. Um, you should stay at home as much as possible, just do not, just, you know, reduce your contact with other people, it will reduce the chance you get the virus. If you think about the spreading of the virus as this, there's a person A who got this virus, and he later, he or she, let's say he, started to develop some syndrome, and now he knows. So when he knows that he has this disease and may have spread to people, he knows that he has it, and people he has close contacts with has it. So those people should all isolate themselves and um, uh, just eliminate unnecessary contact with other people for several days. Usually recommended for 14 days, you stay at home and see if you have any syndrome development. And this will help the virus um, get contained within a very limited amount of people. So at this point, there is more than 20,000 cases, confirmed cases of coronavirus infection in China, and over 400 deaths. And that report was from WHO yesterday. And in America, there's only 11 confirmed cases and zero deaths. So we don't really have to worry about it so much at here, um, around here. But just keep in mind, like any flu or cold or common cold or the new coronavirus that come this year. Uh, make sure that we wash our hands 
frequently and prepare our food well, um, you have to cook them thoroughly. And if anybody has syndrome at home, meaning cough, fever, and short of strength, uh, and lack of strength, you should seek medical care and do tell people, uh, do tell the medical professional if you have contact with anyone who traveled to China in the last 14 days. So that will be my final advice. Wash your hands, keep safe distance, and if you have syndrome, do call, uh, do call and get medical help. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott, for letting us know how we can best prepare for the flu in case it happens here for the virus, because I don't know if you guys have heard, but there has been a case in Santa Clara of coronavirus amongst those 11 that are in the U.S. So definitely wash your hands after every interaction and um, yeah, look out for um, more news to see if anyone else has it here. And then up next, or maybe we can take a minute to evaluate. a very complex topic and he always takes on very complex topics and I appreciate that from I appreciate hearing that from him because I would like to know how to present something like that multi, multi uh, a complex topic like this on technology where it gives you a it gives you a perspective on how technology becomes successful the struggle with the founders how it affects the marketplace and how we can apply that into our life. Although he was kind of constrained in terms of the way he presented because he had his, he had his uh, pad here and then he had the screen here. So there's a little bit of problems of per in terms of placement. I would say the typical speech would be right here, right? And then you're presenting. Right, that way it's an open, it's more open. The screen is more open for the support for this for the for the audience, and you will have your bullet points. And of course, the problem with presenting in in that format is sometimes you are tempted to look at the screen and then look at the audience, right? So you, whenever you have that chance to look at the audience, make sure that you're making contact and you are expressing a key point and you do express that key point in the way you gesture, in the way you say it, vocal variety, your volume, especially at adding volume to key points. And I think when when in terms of Wyoming's per Wyoming's presentation, you you I did ex I did see the some of some of that in the uh, inflection in your presentation. Maybe more if, if there's a, a key point that you would like to, because I, I'm, I, I gravitate towards what, what the speaker says. 
whenever he emphasizes something to me that that's very important because I oh that that's one thing I should remember right it kind of triggers people's memory also because it's a complex topic he ran a, he ran a time maybe make it shorter right the key points although uh, and also when you when the when something like this speech starts you have to start with an intro that it, I would say it would be an intro that makes 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 you that makes the audience interested in what you're talking about maybe a little bit of perspective on what you're going to talk about and how we don't how would how what are the lessons that you will learn from from the speech and then later on you go to the speech cover key points emphasize those key points and then at the ending cover the key points again and in in a summarized format in the most critical I would say the most critical element that that you would like to impart upon the upon the audience from what he said I noticed that the key points for me then and, and, and I was taking those because it's important for me I just free talk for you what I mean is like it has to be a uh, for how how the business was able to state itself, the expertise that's required to create a business like that, and the marketing methods that was used, and that's pretty much what I picked up. But overall, it was a very good speech in that it showed me how to organize uh, a, a very complex speech for for everyone. Thank you. All right, our next evaluator is Scarlett, who will be evaluating. I want to first by saying, Scott, great speech. I really do appreciate you speaking on this because I feel like if we are listening to the media, it creates hysteria. And what you gave us was education. You gave us um, facts, but you also educated us on the history of Corona, which we otherwise may not have known. So I appreciate that. I also appreciate how your speech was structured. You told us exactly what you were going to talk about, and you spoke about that. You gave us the, the details of your speech from the very beginning, and then that's what you laid out for us. So I really do appreciate that. I appreciate that you gave us how it impacts you personally and with your with the stories that you share with your parents and where you're from. Um, I appreciate how you, how you um, tied into what you first <coughs> thought when you heard about it. I appreciate the fact that you uh, gave us what it is, what it really, what the details of actually what it is and how we can protect ourselves and what to look for. So that was really, really good. I um, I liked how you ended it as well by saying, if you see these symptoms, this is what you do, A, B, and C. So it's something that we could all take notes and recognize something we can take home from your speech. I really do appreciate that. A few things, uh, you did really good with your eye contact. I saw you visually looking around at everyone and uh, making eye contact you had really good hand gestures as well you didn't really use the stage much you kind of stayed in this position so one positive feedback I can give you is kind of move around like you know make contact with people like you're actually having a personal conversation with them explaining it to them because it's kind of a um, I do like how you explained it though because you you didn't uh, explain it like the news is doing breaking news you know you kind of were like it's like the flu look for these symptoms you know, you, you kind of calm down the mass hysteria, but you could have connected with your crowd a little bit more by moving around. So that was one thing. You had, your projection was good, but it could have been better. You could have projected your voice in different ways. So just one, th that's another thing to kind of look out for. And that's what I got for you. So thank you, Scott, great speech. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I actually took notes that I'm going to take home with me. So, <laughs> nice job. <laughs> and with that, I believe that I'm supposed to now turn it over to our Toastmaster. Or, yes. <coughs> so maybe we can take another minute to evaluate. No, I'll oh, no. switch over yeah. to. Oh, just kidding. Okay, and then we have um, the toast mess, or the table topics mess. Table topics, yeah. Yay. A table topic is like an, uh, um, 
Okay. Awesome. Elson, I'm considering for you to memorize the topic of the day and also the chance for everybody to memorize the new words, the concept into your speech. And um, take a deep breath. The first question I would like to ask is uh, Do you think what makes a person a celebrity? coming to my mind is of, of course look how handsome or attractive the person is I think that's one of the elements that makes celebrity celebrity but personally the celebrity that stands out most to my mind is that whether they have a strong opinion on something and, and do not afraid to and not afraid to express that um, to the public knowing that some of some of the audience might disagree with you and they might hate you for that one uh, the, if I think about why do I feel that as a major element of the celebrity is that maybe I do not express myself in the real world. I always look for my boss, boss's approval or my colleague's approval whenever I try to express <coughs> my opinionated opinion. So, yeah, to summarize and then to answer your question, yeah, if the, if celebrity has a strong gut or a strong mind to express their feeling and then do the right thing, I think that will make celebrity celebrity and most beautiful person in the world. The next question is now you are like kinda understand how about celebrity. So if you trade your life with a celebrity, who it would be and why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, right? If I could trade my life with a celebrity, it would be the ultimate celebrity, which is the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason is that I could make the biggest influence in the world. So if I have a vision of how I would like the world to be and how the relations to be between countries and, and what I would like America to accomplish in the next four years, I think that's the best avenue for that. It's less glamorous than being Brad Pitt or you know, uh, Matt Damon, but in terms of influence and real change, I think it's the ultimate opportunity. Future President of the United States. I All right. Um, so a lot of people believe, actually believe, that celebrities are overpaid and are given more recognition than leaders in politics, and can affect things such as popular culture. Do you believe this as well? Why or why not? Hey, Sara, next to you. Yeah. What was the last part of the question? Uh, do you believe this as well? Why or why not? Uh, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I actually do. Uh, so I <coughs> relatively young. So I use Instagram, Facebook, a lot of the social medias. And on a given day, one of the celebrity posts a video, and she has you know, 10, 20 million subscribers worldwide watching her. How many people watched the State of the Union address last night? Right. You, can, you can probably do the math. So just by rest, I'm pretty sure the celebrity more people see the celebrity on a day to day basis than they see politicians. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's debatable. <laughs> However, I think in terms of ju just their influence, I think it's definitely there. The second point I'm trying to make here is also uh, the level of connection. With a politician, you see them on TV, 
but you don't really feel you have any connection with them. They're just a name, just somebody holding that office. But with a celebrity, when you see them interacting on a video, and sometimes when you see them up close in person, you actually feel a more personal connection with them. You actually share their emotions and become more aware of what they stand, what they truly stand as a person on various issues. So to that end, I do think they also have a deeper connection with their audience than the political leaders. I hope they use to uh, use those influence for good purposes. And, um, and so far, I think you know, most celebrities have done a pretty good job on that. So I think that's a good thing. one is a no almost by definition. To my way of thinking, to be a celebrity, you have to be at least reasonably famous. Now, I'm known by known to members of several clubs in the area. Uh, I'm sure there are a few people who have seen a handful of things I put on YouTube. So I'm known by, per, on a first name basis, by perhaps one, 200 people, tops, 50 probably more likely. That's probably average for most people anywhere in the world. If, if you take a look at like a couple degrees of separation, given anybody's friends, families, associates, you're gonna wind up with a list of maybe like about 50 to a couple hundred people who have heard of them. To be a celebrity, I think you need to be known by at least let's say 1% of the population of the country. <laughs> Maybe a little bit less. That's a fairly low bar. That's a, a relatively small number of people. In the uh, United States, for example, we have about 3 million people. So if you were known by, let's say, 300,000 of them, I would say that would make you a celebrity. I'm not up there. And that's pretty much all I can say about that. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I could have said no and then walked off stage. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm going to let them hang over the control to you. Yeah. Oh, nice. Thank you for the topics. It was very interesting to see everyone's views on celebrities and their own view on being a celebrity. And um, from now, maybe we can go over the... the so, oh, general value. This is the part of the meeting where we actually, I evaluate the evaluators and then I evaluate the meeting. So I'll start with the, our first evaluators, Jose. You were evaluating Mo Ming. You did a really good job evaluating Mo Ming. It can be difficult to evaluate someone who's been doing speeches for such a long time. Uh, the only thing I would say with respect to the feedback you gave him is you did seem to repeat some points a couple of times. Maybe it's because also in, in his own speech, you were repeating a couple points a few times as well. So that might be part of it. Possibly it's also because you were doing so many different jobs this time around. So maybe you were just a little scattered. I think that if you had a bit more time to, to pull things together, you might have been able to get rid of some of the repetition and, and shorten things and make things a little more clear. So that would be a little feedback out of you. But the feedback was very, very good feedback. Charlotte, I thought you did a really good job with the way you gave feedback to Scott on his speech. You were very clear with all your points. You, even when you were saying like you should move, you actually moved your body to indicate to what exactly what you were talking about versus like moving your hands or something like that. I, like I said, I thought it was very clear, very easy to understand. I really don't have any feedback for you. And like I said, I thought you did such a good job with it. Um, and it, like I said, it's so clear and organized. I can't really think of anything that I would have added to it. With respect to the rest of it, oh, 
Let's see. I guess I'm supposed to also call in the duty masters. So I will start with the timer for the duty master. Postmasters, fellow guests. Here's the time report. Wyming had nine minutes, ten seconds for a speech. He had extra time. Scott, seven minutes, eight, 18 seconds. Star led, two minutes, 30 seconds for uh, the evaluation. Mizu, one minute, seven seconds. Max, 45 seconds. Tao, one minute, 40 seconds. And Dan, a minute and seven seconds. We have kind of a quasi grammarian off counter in Dan today. I think I'll get both reports at once if you don't mind. That'd be great. Why, Ming? You had two extraneous shows, a double clutch, but I noticed that you tend to have some difficulty matching your tenses, pres present and past, as well as plural singular. Like, for example, what they were able to do is, that's a mix of past tense and present tense, or the success factors was, that's a singular versus plural uh, issue, which would have been were and in the first case uh, was. Scott, I counted four ums, two double clutches, and a you know, and also a similar difficulty with the tenses, like how this virus started and become, instead of became, a problem. This is a typical problem amongst people who maybe were raised with languages that don't have the same plural, plural tenses and present past tenses that English does. Jose, your big issue is double clutches. When you say something, when you say something, and then repeat, repeat it. You have 13 of those and two ums. Starlet, I counted four ums, two double clutches, and two you knows, and I have to say, just as a caveat on that, I noticed them much more clearly with you because you speak so clearly that they really jump out at me. For other speakers, I probably missed a lot of them because I listen and say, is that an um? I don't know, it's kind of mumbling. <laughs> In your case, you weren't doing that, which is a good thing, but it makes the, uh, the issues pop out. So divide by two if you want to uh, calibrate for what everyone else was doing. <laughs> Mizu, I counted two double clutches. Uh, Max, uh, just one extraneous you know. And Tao, uh, one you know, an um, and one ah. Uh. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone uh, with the word master any counsel? Mm, that's fine. That's, that's, so I think <laughs> I use the word. Uh, who well, else? You've used the word, but I don't think anyone else has. OK. I Pretty sure there were at least two people. Who used that. We'll we'll just go with that. Yay! We'll do it. We'll do a better job next time, guys. Yay! All right. And do we have a joke master today? Any jokes? While people think of a joke, maybe they want to volunteer. I will continue to evaluate the meeting. So, with respect to evaluation for the meeting, I would say that our we did have an issue with starting later today. We were supposed to start at seven fifteen or so. I think we started closer to a little after 7.30. Obviously, we'll work on that. Other than that, I think we did a good job wrapping things up and pulling things together. And with that, I will then look for a joke. If you want one, or <laughs> later, whatever. I like that. Otherwise, uh, auxiliary to give me the ballots. We, yes, we also need to get our ballots over here, including me. Two, two people. And <laughs> I need someone to fill in for our president. So who's going to be our it will acting be, uh, our president? It'll be LVP Education. Well, so with that, I will then turn our meeting over to our backup acting president, Jose, who once again is doing lots of roles today. Yeah. Yay! Thank you very much for coming today. For our guests, I would like to elicit your feedback as far as how we did. Uh, who is our guest? Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> How, oh, what were your impression of the meeting? Um, actually, it is very impressionable. You know, I, uh, this is my first time here. I bring my friend over here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> How about you, Patricia? Oh my God, I'm so impressed because they can encourage me to try to be openly and try to listen carefully and use some like a summary. Yeah. Uh, everyone do very good. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Well,
class. It's also it, it's more than speaking. It's also organizing, yeah. giving feedback. So you have to think you have to think uh, right there on the spot and come up with what you see. So it's it's very very interactive. So I like it very much. Okay, thank you very much for for our guests for your feedback. And we'll go ahead. Let's give it a drum roll for best evaluator Starlet. TLI, Toastmasters Leadership Institute, for any officers who haven't trained yet. There are going to be officer training sessions there for everyone else. There are going to be various educational sessions as long as the uh, breakfast. The educational sessions will discuss matters of public speaking. There's also going to be one forum for anyone who's interested in participating, participating in the Tall Tales contest about how to deliver a tall tale. That's going to be this Saturday from early in the morning, about 7 a.m., I forget the exact starting time, to 1 p.m., you can sign up for it on d101tm.org. Uh, if you click on training, it'll be like the top item when you go there. Also, please note that, that uh, apparently we'll be having a club contest for international speech and tall tales on the 19th. Uh, February 19th. If anyone hasn't signed up for that yet, please uh, do with uh, an officer here. The international speech contest is five to seven minutes. You have to have given at least six CC speeches or two Pathways levels to participate. Tall Tales is three to five minutes about, it's a humorous speech about some hilariously over the top exaggerated subject and anyone who's a member in good standing uh, can participate in that no matter how many, few, uh, many or few speeches you've given. Uh, also, uh, just a brief warning, I want you to know, somebody here stole my copy of Microsoft Office. Whoever it is, I will find you. 
You have my word. Seriously? Uh, <laughs> that was a joke. No, that was a joke. All members, we were going to think about your your uh, tall tales speech, right? 